The kernel of every culture is gastronomic. The person who wrote that was the French anthropologist Edgar Morin. The history of a nation's table is a reflection of a nation's civilization. The person who wrote that was the French chef Auguste Escoffier. Are the assertions true or are they special pleading, the French defining other nations according to a specifically French criterion? run into problems with the Scoffier's dictum. For the British seldom eat at table. They mostly eat anywhere else. Their eating habits derive from the fairground. We're surrounded by fast food. We can't escape it. It's inside us and outside us. It's like pop music, ubiquitous, unbidden, all pervasive. And even when we're not eating it, we can see it. Or we can see representations of it, adverts for it, exhortations to buy some, stuff some in. And when we're neither eating it nor looking at it, we can smell it. Fast foods is the noxious stench which defines our era. It is our tallow, our coal gas, our sewage. And it's about as fragrant as coal gas, about as enticing as the sewage it will become. We breathe it just as we tread in it. It turns us into passive eaters. No, I don't. Well, not if I don't have to. But I frequently have no option. This is, after all, Britain in the early 21st century. Britain in the early 20th century so different. This nation's appetite for fast food goes back a long way. All that's new is the name and the increasing variety of such foods. The first fast food was fish and chips. The earliest fish and chip shops opened in the East End of London in the mid 19th century. Till then, deep frying was a cooking method that was barely known in this country. This quintessential British dish, the so-called national dish, was introduced by Sephardic Jews. Sephardi derives from a Hebraic word for Spanish. And deep frying is an old Spanish practice. The indigenous frying agent is olive oil. Indeed, it was olive oil's ubiquity and cheapness which prompted the development of deep frying. <laughs> Olive oil can be heated to a much greater temperature than Britain's indigenous frying agents. The higher the heat, the crisper the batter or potato or whatever is fried in it will be, and the less they will absorb the oil. Britain adopted deep frying without possessing the essential ingredient. This is the first but by no means last instance we shall see of inappropriate imports, of approximations. 
Britain's indigenous deep frying agents are animal fats, beef dripping and pork lard, both of which seem to ensure a soggy, saturated chip. Britain does not, of course, use horse fat, which is widely employed in Belgium, Germany and northern France. It's a way of using up the entire horse, everything but the whinny. However, the British are a selectively fastidious people who prefer not to exploit horse as meat. Why not? Because our sentimentality about species is as inconsistent as our squeamishness about what parts of the animal we're willing to eat. We do not knowingly eat horse or spleen. We do not knowingly eat donkey or duodenum. Yet we do eat fast food, which is one of the several paradoxes of British gastronomy, though gastronomy may not be quite the right word. We have very little idea of what goes into fast food, and its presentation doesn't prompt us to ask. The primary requirement of fast food is that it should be visually appealing. Appearance is paramount. Britain eats with its eyes rather than with its tongue. The visual appeal is achieved by presenting the stuff in simple geometrical forms which obliterate any connection with the source of the food. A baton of battered fish is an abstraction. Processed food is disguised food. There is no visual link between a perfectly round beef burger and the former bull whose meat it is composed of. Equally, the names beef and pork are euphemisms which obliterate the link to the animals they come from. The word pork allows us to forget that a perfectly cylindrical sausage is composed of pig, mostly. Small wonder I am crying I can smell that mum is frying I got reason to be grizzling My late dad's in there sizzling I'm still a pig, but they are pork A meaty treat for a knife and fork <laughs> Heaven's pasture, from sty to mouth A treat in a skin <laughs> The sales of Heaven's pasture sausages famously slumped when this advertisement explicitly linked the supposedly edible product to the death of animals. I'm now going to show you how to make what is mysteriously known as the Great British Banger, although only a nation with a collectively defective palate could possibly deem this aberration great. This is the first essential ingredient. The second essential ingredient is MRM. This interesting product must be cooked at an extremely high temperature to kill the bacteria in the excrement which it invariably includes. MRM stands for Mechanically Recovered Meat. It is the animal death industry's name for abattoir slurry. The food biz may not possess much aptitude for edible product, but it certainly has a memorable talent for evasive euphemism. The third ingredient is a rich cocktail of flavor enhancers, colorants, stabilizers, emulsifiers, preservatives, hydrogenators. The fast food industry is a department of the chemical industry. The 
fourth ingredient of any fast food is its branding. This is the truly important stuff. Packaging, marketing, advertising. These necessarily belong to visual media. We see before tasting. We see instead of tasting. We're complicit with the marketing. We're unwilling to look behind it. We're too lazy to ask, what does this product actually contain? What are we being sold? Curiosity is something that gets swept beneath the carpet. Greasy, dyspeptic ignorance is clearly a form of dull bliss. There have long been convenience food brands. It is the one area of food production in which Britain leads Europe. Again, lead may not be quite the right word. The fast food and convenience food industry is not separate from the rest of the food industry. It is the food industry, the British mainstream. Brands have taken over. They have insidiously achieved a position of primacy. Our relationship with its products contaminates our relationship with all foodstuffs. And when the Heffalump family finishes its breakfast, Mr. Heffalump kisses Mrs. Heffalump and the baby Heffalumps goodbye. He puts on his hat and goes off to work. Monday is washing day. When Mrs. Heffalump has cleared the table, she fetches the wash tub, the washboard, and the mangle What's so the that. Mangle? Mind your own bleeding business, you scruffless little git! so that she can get rid of all those unsightly stains. The babies play while their mother multi-skills and omni-tasks, and so passes another day. At five o'clock, Mr. Heffalump leaves work. When he arrives home, the family is nowhere to be found. Do you know what? The old abattoir mob came round. They shot Mrs. Heffalump and the little Heffalumps and turned them into lumps of heifer. Let's look at Mrs. Heffalump and the babies as they are now. They might be anything. The day will soon arrive when children no more know where meat comes from and they know what a mangle is. Do you know where meat comes from? No. What about you? Do you know where meat comes from? Mm, no. It is not just ourselves we harm through eating fast food. The globalisation of burgers reached Britain in 1976. Since then, there has been a tenfold increase in the number of street robberies and a 30% increase in serious assaults. A recent experiment has shown that dietary supplements fed to young offenders have caused a 40% reduction in attacks on prison staff. Here's Dr Vigo Bream. Social determinism, architectural determinism. Discredited, the both. A blunt stick to a donkey, you might say. But dietary determinism, now you're cooking on the gas cooker. Dietary determinism goes to the very kernel of the nitty-gritty. It is precise. Young food addicts commit crime because their diet deprives them of the vital vitamins which encourage the flow of serotonins which determine civil behavior. So, cut out young food, cut out crime. Let them eat apples. An apple a day keeps the policeman at bay.
country's industrialization need not mean industrial food. Most industrialized countries have succeeded in retaining non-industrial food. They have not succumbed to fast food nor to supermarkets, which supply us with our domestic fast food. In Britain, supermarkets are the places which supply ready meals to reheat, packaged food, trash food, the fast food which we eat off our laps and not in the street. Sapphire sexiest, sea kale sexiest. But if they're not in your local Tesco, don't worry. Everything tastes greaty with this little Lothario of a sauce. So put your yummy cauliflower florets to steam for a max of three minutes and just whip up 12 cl. We eat food we haven't cooked because we've lost the ability to cook it ourselves. Among the reasons that we've lost that ability is that cooking has been turned into a base form of light entertainment. It's something we watch. We watch characterful cards do it in our lieu. Little more than a generation ago, they would have been sawing their glamorous assistant in half in a variety show. However, there would have been no pretense then that they were instructing their audience in something to do at home. If you've only got low-fat hazelnut, nothing to worry about. Scrummy in freshly grated parmesan. But don't be fussy. You can pack down smoky bacon crisps, dilute with a jet of Malibu, or Guinness, or Red Bull, or all three. And you're almost there for the final touch. You'll need a sprinkle of a finely finely chopped chives or hand-crushed pretzels and a dusting of Spanish smoked paprika. But icing sugar will do. <laughs> I've got the finished product here. Yes, it's one I made earlier. <laughs> How post-ironic can you get? <laughs> Oh, that was masterful, Bart. Yeah. OK, studio, can we set up for the Canny Cook Council? Stylist, let's get a real shine on that chicken. No one cooks this stuff at home, if cook is the word, which it isn't. It's assembly rather than cooking. The more telly shows we see, the less we cook ourselves. Cooking has become a displacement activity. Lack of time, lack of know-how. Those are the standard excuses. Cooking is a craft which demands a certain rigour. It has to be practised rather than spectated. We no more learn to cook by watching these people than we learn to play international soccer by watching the World Cup. Fast food and telly chefs are, however, mere symptoms. They aren't the causes of these islands' gastrocultural bereavement. The British can, after all, write, engineer, explore, film, die, philosophize, dig, invent, compose, act. But the British can barely cook. They are unfamiliar with raw products. There are historic reasons for this. The first reason is the enclosures, which is merely the empowered's euphemism for its appropriation of common land. Anywhere that was of agricultural or silvicultural use was nabbed by the aristocracy. That meant most of Britain. The geological and topological complexions of this country are peculiarly susceptible to industrial agriculture. The land is seldom precipitous, rarely mountainous. It's thus appropriate to large-scale production. It is not by chance that the earliest implements of industrial agriculture derived from Norfolk which has become the exemplar of all Britain's agriscapes. It is increasingly prairie, an outdoor factory without a roof, and no hedges to prevent the dissipation of topsoil. 
Agri-industry not only produces muck, it is not only an aesthetic blight, it is too environmentally degrading. The pursuit of short-term profit is already leading to long-term destruction. Greed and green are a single letter and many miles apart. Henry went into the family regiment, cashiered, I'm afraid. Jamie went into the city, spot of bother with a serious fraud squad. Tim took orders, defrocked, the usual, I'm afraid. Me, I'm the eldest, and all that you can see is mine. <laughs> the second cause of this country's agricultural structure is primogeniture, by which an estate is left in its entirety to the firstborn. This form of inheritance means that more and more land is owned by fewer and fewer people. And the more land you own, the greater the advantage can be taken of economies of scale. Britain eats to live rather than lives to eat. We regard food as mere sustenance. We suffer the hangover of Protestantism, and the idea of the John Knox cookbook is laughable. Food is something post-Protestants feel guilty about. Denial still permeates our culture. The stuff we shove in our bodies points to a collective self-loathing. And Britain, incredibly, uses the words wicked and sinful to describe chocolates. Burger. Ketchup. Looks like we lost him. Check if he's got a kebab donor card. The paradox is that for all our grim pragmatism about food and our antipathy to its pleasurable potential, we in this country suffer the highest incidence in Western Europe of dietetically derived illnesses. And we're rapidly catching up with the United States of America, which is world leader. We eat negligently. We choose to eat that way. We don't suffer droughts or famine or crop failures. We suffer, on the contrary, the consequences of plenty, circulatory and cardiac diseases, cancer, diabetes, and most manifestly, obesity. This is something I have knowledge of, having been diagnosed as morbidly obese. It was that morbid that prompted me to do something about it. And it's something that you have to do yourself. No amount of governmental propaganda from DEFRA, from the Food Commission, from the Health and Safety Executive can persuade us. Indeed, the incidence of dietary-related diseases seems to increase in direct proportion to the amount of health policing that we're subjected to.
tell me this. How do you keep the toppings on your pizza if you didn't deep fry it? And Mars bars. Mars bars melt. Did you consider that? Obviously not.